Okay, good evening. Uh, it's Tuesday, June 27th, 2017. It's 7 p.m. We're in the council chambers of the City Count Common Council of the City of Platteville, and I'll call this regular meeting to order. We'll start with roll call. Catherine Westaby? Here. Barbara Doss? Here. Don Francis? Here. Barbara Stockhausen? Here. Ken Killian? Here. Eileen Nichols has been excused, and Tom Nall? Here. Okay, the first uh, item on our agenda is a special presentation tonight on the 2016 audited financial statements uh, that were completed by Johnson Black and Company. And Brent, you take the floor. Thank you. Yep, my name is Brent Nelson. I'm an audit manager with Johnson Black and Company here reporting on the 2016 financial statements. Um, we issued our bound report, which is about a 60, 70 page document. Um, and I do have that with me that we can go over if there's any questions in detail. Uh, but my focus tonight was to go over the, the PowerPoint slideshow, uh, a higher level overview of the 2016 financials. And the, the council members should have a hard copy of this slideshow if some of that gets hard to read, but it is uh, on the back wall PowerPoint. Uh, for those that don't have a hard copy. Um, yes, we've issued our 2016 financial statements and in that we express an opinion on the financial statements and we've expressed an unmodified opinion on those financials. So we believe in all material respects that the financial statements in the bound report are in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. The scope of our audit included all the city's funds, water, sewer, all the governmental funds, all that was within the scope of the audit. Uh, we also looked at the Platteville Housing Authority as part of our audit. It's a separate entity, but we, it's included in the scope of our audit. Management's reviewed the audit report um, and they've accepted the financial statements. Uh, we, in addition to the audit, we, Johnson Block also does some regulatory reporting on behalf of the city. There's a report that goes to the Department of Revenue that we submit and a report for the, to the Public Service Commission for the utility that's required on an annual basis that we submit. Uh, page three, just the 2016 overall financial highlights. Um, governmental funds, that'd be the general fund, debt service fund, TIF district funds. The city has 10 to 15 different funds that it tracks separately. Uh, overall, total governmental funds reported a decrease of about $3.3 million. Uh, general fund, the biggest component of that's general fund was a decrease of about $190,000. Uh, TIF district number seven was the, was the largest decrease for 2016. That was a decrease of about $1.8 million, and I'll get into why that, that occurred. It was mostly a timing issue. Or, uh, uh, timing thing that occurred. So it wasn't a big lo a loss. It was debt that came in in December 2015 for which payments weren't made until January 16. Debt service, similar boat, uh, decreased approximately $1.1 million. Uh, TIF district number six decreased approximately $120,000. Uh, and the re redevelopment authority decreased $129,000. Um, so those are the, there's multiple more funds that I didn't go over, but those are the biggest factors that played into that overall total decrease. Um, I alluded to it, TIF 7 and the debt service fund, the big decreases we're seeing there was mostly a timing, uh, or the majority of that was a timing uh, with debt being issued in December 2015 and uh, a payment to a developer not made until January 16, and then debt not being refinanced until January 16. Uh, the general fund on an overall basis reported favorable variances it, compared to the budget. Net position of the water and sewer utility, we, we show those separate, um, increased approximately $1.3 million for calendar 2016. Looking just a uh, line graph on just the general fund. So looking specifically at the general fund, this is the trend in total general fund fund balance. Uh, five year look, uh, the 
change between 2015 and 2016, as I mentioned, was a decrease of about 190,000 um, during 16. Uh, looking at the five-year trend on the far right, 2016 is on the <coughs> lower side of the five-year trend uh, of fund balance. There's different classifications of fund balance. There's unassigned fund balance, assigned for certain purposes, restri restricted for certain purposes. Uh, the city's fund balance policy for the general fund is that it maintain unassigned general fund balance of a minimum of 20% of general fund expenditures is the city's past policy. Um, overall, the, the fund balance is 33% of 2016 expenditures, so above that, that city policy. Um, as of 1231-15, the, the unassigned compared to expenditures was only 26%, so went up from 26% up to 33%, and well above the city's policy. Still looking at governmental funds, being the general fund, TIF districts, all that's included in this, in this pie chart. Uh, with a comparative look in the middle of the page, 2016 total revenues, uh, with 2015 to the right side of that. But the biggest piece of the pie, the biggest revenue source of the city is tax revenue, and that is <coughs> local levy plus the tax incremental financing districts, the increments they're earning. So that made up 46% of total revenues of the city for calendar year 2016. Second biggest revenue source is intergovernmental revenues being 38% of total revenues. Um, just some notable changes between years, uh, things that change comparing 15 to 16. Intergovernmental revenues decreased by approximately $631,000. Uh, when looking at 15 compared to 16. Uh, majority of that was some EDA grant revenue, some CDBG grant revenue that hit the books in 2015 um, without similar revenue sources in 2016. Miscellaneous revenues were up about 275,000 between years, and that's primarily due to donations for the trail project and then some donations for the library proje project. That's showing up within miscellaneous revenues in our audit. Public charges for services decreased a little over half a million dollars, um, mainly due to the change in how the ambulance, the city ambulance is running that's not running through the city anymore. Um, and also 2015 was the last year of a developer payment. So those, uh, were, those are the primary factors that led to that decrease between years. Mentioned intergovernmental, intergovernmental revenue is the second biggest revenue source. The biggest revenue sources of that is transportation aid, about 742,000, and shared taxes of 2,472,000. That's revenue coming directly from the state of Wisconsin. Uh, looking at the 2016 tax roll levied in 2016, primarily collected in 2017. The biggest piece of the pie with the city within uh, its taxing jurisdictions, the biggest part of that levy goes to the Platteville School District, about 30, 39% of that levy. And second biggest is the city, city levy being about 28% of the total levy. Looking at a five-year trend in the city's property taxes, excluding TIF district increment, looking just solely at the local tax levy. Um, 2016 is the highest. It's steadily increased over the past five years. Over the past five years, it's increased approximately 11%, not on an annual basis, but from 2012 to 2016. On an annual, the annual increases range from about two to 5% um, on an annual basis for those years. trend in equalized value of the property within the city has also seen a steady increase over the past five years. Um, the valuation on, has increased 18.2% since 2012 to 2016. Um, 
on an looking at a, specifically on an annual basis, it's typically been about a one to three percent increase in the equalized value on an annual basis. Uh, the outlier being the change between 2013 to 2014 when it increased about 12 percent just in that one year. 2016 net new construction was six point little over six point six million dollars, or one percent. Uh, of the 2015, so the city grew by a little over 1% for two, in 2016. And that, that number's important because it plays into the, how much the city can levy, it can increase its levy by the net new construction. Uh, the trend in shared revenues, is, it's the biggest revenue source that comes from the state of Wisconsin to the city, and that's been, over the past five years, very flat. Uh, hovering around at a little bit more than 2.5 million from 2012 to 2016. And the state has provided an estimate of what 2017 would be, and it's right on the same, about 2.56 million. So about exactly the same as what it was last year. Looking, uh, changing now to the expenditure side. 2016 on the left side compared with a comparable 2015 number, uh, the biggest expenditure for the governmental funds for 2016 was capital outlay and debt service, both being about 22% of total expenditures. Uh, servicing the debt was a, a little bit skewed this year because there was some debt refinancing in jet January 2016. Otherwise, debt service isn't that big of a expenditure isn't the top expenditure, but due to that refinancing, it was higher this year. Public safety was the third biggest, and public safety saw a decrease this year that goes hand in hand with the decrease in ambulance revenue, some of those expenditures not flowing through the city in 2016. Public works increased a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, bus service increased their hours, and the, there was some remodeling done at the airport that gets shown within the public works category. Conservation and development had the most significant increase between years. Um, and that was due to a developer incentive payment that was made in January 2016 that this, the city issued debt to pay. Uh, capital outlay saw a decrease between years. Um, this, and outlays vary between years. The, the capital outlays in 2015 were higher, primarily due to the EDA grant that was going on. So the, the decrease in capital outlay expenditures goes hand in hand with the decrease in grant revenue. And then debt service also went up, primarily due to that debt refinancing. And then TIF-5 has been aggressively paying down debt, their principal balances on loans. Uh, switching gears to water and sewer utility. Uh, it's a combined water and sewer utility that the city reports, uh, combined water and sewer. So the biggest revenue source is the metered measured sewer service is 48% of the revenue for the city's utility fund, with water being roughly 28%. And re revenues for utility revenues 2016 compared to 2015 were pretty steady between years. And then on the expense side of the utilities, the biggest expense of the utilities is depreciation, the um, depreciation on all the, the plant, the equipment, the mains, all the infra utility infrastructure within, within the city limits. Um, administrative in general is the second highest cost within the utilities followed by servicing the interest on, on the outstanding debt. Just looking at the city's total long-term obligations, governmental activities at the top would be general fund debt service, uh, TIF district debt service. Overall outstanding debt, general obligation debt for just the g governmental activities was a little over $21 million. So that would include general and the TIF district debt. Uh, business type activities is, is goes hand in hand with utilities. They mean the same thing. Uh, their revenue debt was 15,798,000. 
general uh, state statutes limit general obligation debt to 5% of the equalized value within the city limits. So for the city that calculated for 2016 to be 32,595,000. And comparing that to what the city's general obligation debt of 21 million was, there's, there's some capacity there. The city's at about, has about 35% of its borrowing capacity available. If it, uh, if it chose to borrow money, it, it could in accordance with state statutes. But overall, just some concluding remarks. City's general fund balance, I'd say, is a healthy fund balance, being 33% of 2016 expenditures, uh, ex well above the minimum pa uh, policy of the city. Has city has plenty of debt capacity should it choose to issue more debt. Uh, utility rates appear to be providing adequate return, being about a little over 5% of return on return on assets, which is kind of a benchmark that we look at for the PSC to be at least 5% of, of the assets that your operating revenues be. And the, and the city's utility was above that. Uh, during the course of the audit, we received full cooperation by city personnel. The audit went very well. And I want to thank, thank the city for letting us be of, of service. And we're available throughout the year if there's any questions. Is there any <coughs> questions on the PowerPoint? <coughs> I have one question on page three. It says the general fund on an overall basis reported favorable variances that compare to budget. Does that mean variation from budget? So the general fund showed a decrease in fund balance of 190,000, but the city hadn't had budgeted for a decrease in fund balance. So even though it showed a decrease in fund balance, Compared to the budget, it was still, the expenditures budgeted were higher than the actual expenditures incurred. If that's what you're getting at there. So the budget, but so the budget. actual revenue or actual expenses were less than what was projected in terms of expense. So if I, Be if I projected $1,000 for, I don't know, a new computer and got it for 750 that would be a favorable variance? Well, this would be, for, on the revenue side, if you brought in more revenue than you budgeted for, that would be a favorable. Okay. And then on the expenditure, if you spent less than what you budgeted, that would be a favorable. Yeah. So both the revenue okay. and expense side okay. were showing favorable, favorable. balances. <clears throat> Any other questions of Brent? Any other questions? Thank you, Brent. Um, Thank you. Do we, uh, Karen, do we take official action? Accept it or I don't know. Do we have to take it? Well, that's a good question. Have we traditionally no. accepted it? No, no, it's just a presentation. It's just a presentation. Okay, great. No. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on our agenda is a public <coughs> hearing on Ordinance 17-10, amending the Zoning Map Planned Unit Development, uh, 545 West Adams Street. We'll start with staff presentation. Okay, the, the request uh, regarding 545 West Adams Street is uh, regarding uh, uh, the ability to put two duplex units on that property. Um, the property itself is located at the, the far west end of Adams Street, um, where that street ends. Um, it's a little <coughs> over 29,000 square feet of area. It's currently vacant except for a, uh, an old garage. I think that's on that property that would be removed um, as part of the development. Um, so the applicant would like to build two duplex units on that building, two duplex buildings um, that would be used for rental purposes. Uh, they'd be two-story units, um, two-car two car attached garages that go with each unit. Um, so it would be up and down units in each case. There'd be a shared driveway that would provide access to the development from Adams Street. Uh, the property does also have frontage on um, Hickory Street, but it's a fairly narrow frontage. Um, the lot, if you've looked at the maps, is it's fairly large, but it's kind of a, almost a triangular shape. So it's um, got some limited ability as far as full utilization of that 
uh, area. So uh, because of that shape and the, uh, the limited frontage, um, he's not able to split the lot to get two legal parcels that he could build a duplex on each one, um, even though it's got enough land area. Um, so it, as an alternative, he's requesting a planned unit development to allow both buildings on one lot. Um, if this seems familiar, um, it's because it should be for you, those of you that were involved in this um, last fall. Um, this was uh, essentially the same request that was submitted uh, in September of 2016. Um, physically, it's the same request. Um, that request was denied um, on a five to one vote by the council. Um, per, as part of that discussion, there were some concerns um, raised about the density, the number of tenants that uh, theoretically could be living in, in this development. So the applicant this time has uh, included with his proposal um, the recommendation, or at least he'd be open to the idea of having the Arlo limited occupancy overlay district placed on the property. Um, and that overlay district could put a limit on the number of unrelated individuals that could live in each unit. So it'd be capped at a maximum of two unrelated per unit, um, except if they're a family member, if they're all related, then there would be no limit on the number. But as far as uh, what we would consider a, a typical college rental, for example, that would make it a maximum of two tenants per unit. So that uh, applicant has proposed that as a, as a means, I think, of addressing some of the concerns about the, the density. Um, this particular request was again reviewed by our plan commission June 5th. Um, they did recommend denial on a three to two vote. Um, there were some concerns raised about uh, still, I think, the density, the change in the character of the <coughs> neighborhood, um, some runoff uh, concerns. Um, and the plan commission members could fill in anything else. Um, since the, the project is basically the same as last time from a phys physical standpoint, the staff's recommendation is still the same. Um, since the project is large enough uh, to accommodate two duplexes, um, we are generally in favor of the request. However, there are some um, physical conditions, I think, that need to be addressed or, or uh, items that could be uh, better handled. Um, the on-site parking layout, there is enough parking to meet the, the code, um, but there is a condition where some of that parking may be stacked parking. you got to move a vehicle to get out of the garage, uh, et cetera. So I think some uh, modifications to the layout could be made to improve that situation. Um, there are no sidewalks currently proposed to connect the buildings to the street. I think that could be an improvement. Um, there are several retaining walls uh, proposed for the development since it is built into a, a hillside. Uh, we're not exactly sure of the final height of some of these retaining walls and just from a potential safety issue, if, uh, there may be a need for some fencing or other barriers to prevent somebody from accidentally going over those walls. Um, since those driveways uh, essentially are coming in behind some of the existing houses in that neighborhood, there would be will be an issue of headlights kind of shining into uh, backyards. So I think some uh, additional screening, either fencing or other uh, means, uh, should be provided to reduce that impact. And then I think if it gets approved, um, if this part gets approved, the second step, we would need some additional information on just general landscaping and, and building materials, et cetera. Um, so those would be the items we would uh, like to see addressed. Um, are there any questions? <coughs> questions from council members of staff. What percent of the uh, total area would be left as uh, grass? Um, I believe the engineer with development. had said the impervious area will be about 40%. About 60%. 60% would be grass or other. What's other? Grass or other landscape materials. Oh. So that could be patios. Um, well, they don't have any proposed, so. Okay. 
Joe, you did say that the there's nothing in the plans for height of the retaining walls. Uh, well, I know I previously I had, I had talked to the the engineer that did these designs, and he at that time he said it was you know the the grading plans were preliminary. He thought they would only be a couple feet, but um, you know just as a, a caution, I guess I would still like to keep that in there as a potential concern, depending on how they end up. If it's that, if it's only a couple of feet, it, you know, it would, the, the safety part could, I, I think could be addressed by uh, landscaping itself. Um, but we had also talked about the, the headlight issue. And at that time, you know, we kind of, we're under the assumption that a fence could be provided that would solve both problems. Other questions of Joe? If you build retaining walls, how much of the flowage area would be cut off as far as put it in the walls? You know what I'm asking for a question? In other words, now it slopes up from the drainage ditch or drainage way. If you put in retaining walls, then you're going to have to push the water more in the concentrated area. Um, well, I think the the retaining walls are uh, since the uh, the duplexes are two story units, one up, one down. They've got to provide a you know a higher grade at the higher units at the back and a lower grade at the front. <laughs> So most of the retaining wall is to separate that between the units so you have a higher and lower. And the other ones are at the far south side of the lot where they're digging into that hill. Um, generally, the, the drainage is still going to be to the, the northwest, the way it's currently sloped. It would just have to be redirected around the units themselves. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Ken. I was trying to figure out from this this drawing here where the walls would be and what how they, how they would affect, if at all, the drainage, the flowage. That's my question. Are the walls narrowing? The path of the flowage. Uh, I guess I would answer that. I don't think the walls themselves are. I think the buildings are <coughs> affecting the buildings. flow of the drainage. The buildings. So it's concentrating. It's directing it east and west around the buildings. Any other questions of staff? Otherwise, we will <coughs> move along to the applicant statement. The applicant here. Uh, first, I'd like to say, uh, yeah, there is patios. You have to start with your name. Daniel Wittick. Yeah, for the record. Daniel. And your address. Uh, 
currently uh, 214 Mineral Street, Mineral Point, Wisconsin. Great, thank you. Um, you had a question about those patios. And uh, yes, there's covered patios uh, for each unit, um, sizable, and also a garage for each unit. And uh, you'll see that like an option two there. There's a, in those two photos, there's a covered patio on the upper unit and also that other, the second photo is a covered patio for the lower unit. Again, I can uh, accept the denial if it's based on the facts or the truth or the facts, not hype and conjecture. Um, the last time around, a lot of the concerns of the neighbors there were uh, the number of occupants was one of them, and I debunked that by this time trying to pass it with uh, limiting the number of occupants in the condos. Uh, the size of lot, everybody's going on about how the size of lot's not big enough to accommodate two duplexes on there, and it well exceeds the minimum requirement um, needed for two duplexes, and you heard Joe Carroll state that also. Uh, it just is an odd-shaped lot, and it's difficult um, to get the curb frontage. Um, last, or another concern the neighbors had with the fire and trying to get um, emergency vehicles in and out of there. So last week I called the fire inspector and um, he was sort of surprised I called him to ask him the question and his response was uh, that if you get, if you get this accepted, we'll deal with it then. You know, if we'll make something work. That was his response, you know, to the whole thing. He wasn't really too concerned about it. And then um, the water runoff. Last time around, I had Delta three. I don't have the numbers with me right now, but they ran all the numbers. And um, if, no matter what I put on there, the added water is minimal. You know, if I put option one on there, which from what I understand, you can't deny me if I want to do the option one. And um, that will come with a, no garages, but a huge parking lot to uh, accommodate. Um, you got four bedrooms on, e on each side, and then all these college kids are gonna have boyfriends and girlfriends and friends, and you don't want the cars on the street, so it's gonna be able to accommodate 16 or more vehicles. And you're gonna have that parked, or all those vehicles parked out there in the middle of that yard. <coughs> and so if you add up the numbers on that building and that slab versus what I'm proposing in option one, you're gonna have quite a bit less water runoff. And then uh, one more thing here, um, I like to have you all keep in mind that the city staff is in favor of this and you hire these people for their expertise and to make sound decisions in uh, the future of the city. And um, they looked at this whole proposal and they're also in favor of it, like I said. And I'll come back to that a little later. Um, let's see, option one um, is permitted, but the neighbors, Option one is permitted, but um, I don't feel the neighborhood needs many more of those type of buildings. The, the student housing, it decreases property values. Along with, comes that come along, along with what comes with that is the parties from the students. Um, with those buildings, there'll be no garages and junk piled pretty much everywhere. And you'll see that you know, those photos that I took are just random places without driving around town, um, but they're all student housing. Um, along, along with that also comes uh, the occupants to have no sense of ownership to the neighborhood. Um, a building will have this, this, type of, this type of building is put up as cheap as you can and it has no sense of curb appeal also. Um, 
And like I mentioned before, <coughs> this uh, one with this uh, single building on that option one would have that huge parking lot. I, I just you know, personally, if I was a neighbor, I wouldn't want to have all those park cars parked out there in the yard, along with all the garbage that can accom or accumulate around the buildings. Um, option two <clears throat> is what I would like to propose, and that's two high-end duplexes um, and documentation limiting the number of ac occupants. Also, there's garages, huge two-car garages of each unit, and um, there'll be manicured yacht yards. Um, my target market for those condos are the young professionals and mainly the elderly. Uh, they stay longer, um, less wear and tear on the building and damage. These tenants have a these tenants have a sense of responsibility to the neighborhood, and um, I think I mentioned before that like these condos are they're high end, so they're uh, my rent for these are twelve hundred dollars a month. So they're not the type of people that are throwing all their junk out in the yard. And I mean, they want a nice, nicely maintained yard and a condo. Now, I don't know if this is permitted, but like before, I mentioned that the city staff is in favor of this. And I'll, can I ask the city staff a question during this? Yeah. That would generally be permitted. Now, I don't think. Well, I was just, you know, if they, they looked at everything, I, were they concerned about water runoff, you know? And over there. I didn't know if they looked at I, any of that. I, I don't think they have to respond. I mean, I assume that you covered that during your investigation. You don't have to respond. I mean, Delta Three had uh, done a done an analysis, um, and as was stated earlier, um, putting these two units adds very little incremental depth to the water surface level in that ditch that runs behind, you know, runs along the north side of the property. Um, it would be barely noticeable based on these particular ones b compared to the entire drainage area that runs through there. Okay, so I, I have two questions. One question is, do you have a um, water management, a stormwater management plan that's part of your proposal? I, I think mean, the plan, um, I believe, the last time around in this um, layout that Delta 3 proposed and I don't have the correct drawing in front of me but they did have some uh, some sort of, I think they're called rain gardens um, you know ponds to retain some of this water hold it on site I don't know about anybody else but I'm a little concerned I'm a little confused when you say option one and option two well, option one. The only thing that we have is your proposal for a planned unit development. Correct, correct. And that's that's option two, you know, which I'm hoping you give me permission to do. Option one, if, if I'm denied, then I'm back to option one. Which is so, which is what? I mean, a fourplex, basically. No, it's a it's a duplex with. Uh, four bedrooms on each side. It's what everybody's building around here to house these students. And then along comes with that was everything I listed before. And you'll see some photos in that packet that are of some of these type of structures. The two or four bedroom, two bath on each side. And like I said, there's no park or uh, no garages and so all the all the garbage mopeds coolers chairs are just thrown out in the yard 
Okay, does anybody have additional questions I do. for Mr. Wedding? Okay, go ahead. I, want to, I think the landlord is responsible for grab, uh, garbage, put up a shed, make a little unit like the rest of the businesses in town are responsible for to contain all that. Um, that's going to be in futures, some kind of complex has to be built for the trash. And I'm going to look forward to that as each landlord comes forward. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned to you before, the other person that came forward, the neighbors were very adamant on how the residents were going to be treating mm -hmm. the neighbors and the property. So you talked about the garbage, but you would be responsible for the trash because you're paying, well, that's your job. I know, you're but if you look rent, around the city so and... Well, and that's something that our city done. will investigate or has been I think investigating. They, have their, they would have their hands full out there. Well, that's their job. But your job is to keep your property up to date. Correct. And um, you're asking for a proposal to be accepted. And if, I agree. I, I drive around town, too, and it's, it's not pretty in some areas. But I'm looking at your property. Um, the others are working with the city already. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my only other concern is, is I agree, the garage is a great unit, but we had a developer here a while ago, and he did mention that one of the things about garages is it has to be a unit where you park a car, mm -hmm. not a collection of stuff. And that is something the landlord would be responsible for too is that the car actually parks in there. Correct. Not. Yeah, I wouldn't have the, a problem and with the that. Other off, um, the other extra parking we're talking about. Well, that's, yeah, that's part of the reason why I want the garage is it just keeps everything tidier. It's all about being a good neighbor. Okay, other questions of Mr. Wedding? Yes, I have a question. On your option two, you have a uh, photo of I imagine this is one of your units yeah that else. one's in Mineral Point yeah okay looks nice um, I'm wondering if you could um, let's say make it a little bit nicer to look at would you be willing to put shutters things like that yeah yeah you know I'm not a big fan of shutters but I'd be willing to dress it up somehow if that's what the council would want well I'm just looking at the fact is um, it would give a better appearance mm -hmm. to your structure and would probably help with getting tenants sure if you're looking for semi or professional mm -hmm. people um, so I think if you could do something like that mm -hmm. I hopefully that it isn't too expensive. Um, could you do a little bit of brick in front of the garage? Add, mm -hmm. make it, so it makes it look really nice. So mm -hmm. would there be any problem with putting a No, I mean, if that's a contingency or, you know, that wouldn't, that wouldn't hold me up. You know. I'm just looking at it from the fact is that if you're uh, if you're looking at getting the higher rents 1200 um, you're going to want it to look presentable mm -hmm. for, for those types of renters so I'm just throwing it out yeah well I, I was thinking about even that front covered front porch there if that could be you know instead of a shed roof even like a hip roof on it you know, something or even go go a little bit bigger with those pillars. Okay. Um, would you be willing, um, how does uh, mail delivery is done? Would that be going to one central location at the end of Adam Street? Usually uh, every time I put one, something up, they tell me how they want me to do it. Okay. Yeah, the post office does, I call them and the postmaster. That's all that I have. Do you have other properties in Platte? I have one, uh, a duplex 
um, on uh, Ellen, Ellen Street, 350A and B Ellen. And uh, they, they have garages and they're higher end and um, they, they don't have a covered patio. They just have a patio out and you can drive over there and there's no garbage. Any other questions? Uh, going back as far as question on garages. So if you were to build option one, would you build any garages at all? No, probably not. No, no garages? That just, uh, it's all about the cost factor, you know, and um, it's what everybody's putting up. Uh, I, personally, I'm not a big fan of student housing. I don't like being involved in it, you know. Um, I'd really like to do the option two and just have a higher end type unit. And uh, construction costs have gotten so expensive since the markets have turned around, economies turned around, things are going right through the roof. And um, by being able to get two of them on there, it just would help cut the costs down. Um, I could do the option one and it's like everybody else is doing just the cheapest building, <coughs> cheapest siding and because they know the students are going to tear it up anyway. I just prefer not to. Um, and uh, just like I mentioned before, um, two of these units would easily, easily fit on the, this lot. And water runoff is not an issue. Okay, if no one has any additional questions, I then oh, you do. Okay, <laughs> Don. Can you describe the staff have given a recommendation, but they have concerns. For instance, about the retaining walls, sure. fencing, screening. What are your uh, answers to that? What's well, all about what they have in mind, or uh, their concern is, you know, like the retaining walls. I'm not quite certain, but it, isn't it if they're over? X amount of feet, you have to uh, have a guardrail on them. You know, I guess I'm sort of going by whatever the city requires. Um, I think if it makes it past this, I don't remember if I heard Joe correctly, but if it makes it past this phase and then it goes to the next phase and then they have some things that they want addressed on there. Maybe if I could just jump in and just refresh and with respect to the plan unit development process, this is sort of the concept phase. If you were to approve the concept, then it would move forward to a site-specific plan and you'd have the opportunity to give feedback on uh, more of the design details associated with the project. But I'm open to any ideas, even like Tom said down there, on overall exterior. Um, just trying to dress it up a little bit if need be. So. Do you have any concern about the amount of concrete that's going to be there? Because more or less it seems to be like eight driveways worth of concrete. Um, not particularly because of uh, I still have 60% of green space. That's quite a bit. I don't know what the minimum requirement is in an R2. But 60% is well over that, I'm pretty sure. So you're not concerned? Okay. Uh, yeah. Are you the one responsible for snow removal? I hire an outfit to do that, yeah. The, uh, this would, I don't see them, they wouldn't be able to use a truck on this, they'd have to use a skid steer. Would that be a and they're concerned that large trucks you're saying right there, like uh, someone who wants to move in with a U-Haul has to be a certain type of truck size mm. to make a turn onto the... There's one hard hard corner, and uh, but it's, it's a 90 degree corner, so they should be able to make that. I know I'm... I remember Delta Three talking, or uh, Dan Drazen talking about that a little bit during one of our meetings, getting a truck in and out of there. So I'm pretty sure he co covered it in laying this out. 
but that can be addressed too, you know, at a, the next phase of this, if uh, need be. Sure. Anybody else with questions, of Mr. Weddy? Okay, then we'll move to the next uh, part of the public hearing, which is uh, public statements in favor. <coughs> And I believe I have one person who wants to speak in favor. Did Mr. Schmidt? No? No, I want to address what I want to mention. Oh, okay. That's different. Okay. Thank you. That's all right. All right. Then I have uh, several. Any, it, so that was the only registered to speak in favor. I have some people who have registered but don't want to speak, who have said that they are registering against this, and that would be Marilyn Gottschalk. So please enter that in the record. And I have several people then who have asked to speak. So we'll start with Mr. Balwig. Hello, I'm Ben Balwig, along with my wife, Pat. We reside with our family at uh, 400 Short Street. <clears throat> Mr. Wedig is coming before the council tonight with the same proposed design as he did last fall, demonstrating to the council and to the citizens of Platteville living in the Adams Street neighborhood that his financial bottom line takes precedence over all else. About four years ago, we moved our <clears throat> purchased our home after looking for nine months because we liked the house and its location. This is a neighborhood of larger lawns, mature trees. <clears throat> Excuse me. The lot in question is a beautiful green space, which is a proposal would fill with two large duplexes, driveways, retaining walls and fences. With those duplex becomes a possibility of eight vehicles, doubling the current traffic flow on Adams Street. It's a short dead end street with no traffic sign at, it, at its intersection. The statements in your packets under the wedding plan unit development, page 99, the project should have little effect on the surrounding properties. Nice infill for the vacant lot are highly inaccurate. As they were, as were the statements made at the plan commission meeting. <clears throat> a Telegraph Herald article, sellers appreciating higher home prices, was referred to as being a pertinent in the discussion about the need for the type of entry level housing that Mr. Wedding is offering. In fact, it stated there is a high demand and low supply of homes on the market for mid-ranged homes in Platteville. It went on to say there is a lot more competition for that price range and buyers who are willing to pay more. There was nothing about rental units. Also, despite previous statements, it is not difficult to determine that the removal of mature trees, the replacement of natural vegetation with the amount of impervious surfaces in this design will considerably increase the runoff from this lot as illustrated by the image, images on your copies from the State of California Water Boards. Please note, however, unlike the pictures, this lot slopes towards a drainage ditch which already runs full with heavy rains. <clears throat> the heart of the neighborhood, and therefore the city, is a healthier when there is a balance between homeowners and landlords. We who call this home our area, this area our home, 
respectfully ask Mr. Weddy to look at all possibilities and bring forth a design plan that honors and respects our neighborhood. We also respectfully request the City Council to vote against the plan unit development, keeping this property zoned R2 and vote to accept Mr. Weddick's proposal to place this lot in a unit limited occupancy overlay district. Are there any questions or? Anybody? Thank you, Mr. Baller. Thank you. Uh, also uh, registering uh, to speak against Ellsworth Hood. So yeah, Ellsworth Hood, 580 West Cedar Street, which is uh, directly south of the uh, proposed uh, piece of, of development. Uh, <coughs> and uh, <laughs> the last time I think we, we met, I was joking about uh, Yogi Bear as uh, this is deja vu all over again, again. <laughs> now that we're at it uh, for the, oh, I don't know, fourth time or whatever. Anyway, uh, I think that Mr. Boydick made a pretty good uh, pitch in a certain sense, see? But actually, uh, the way in which he put his, his pitch is a bit of blackmail. Because right? if you don't let me do what I want, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build an instant student slum. Right? Take that, folks. Right? Uh, you know, that's, that's a source of some, somewhat of a separate question from the validity of the proposal itself. Right? It's, he presented it as if there's an either, either or. Right? Either I get what I want right now, or I build a student slum. Right? There are other options. Right? He could build one of those really nice apartments, you know, a duplex. Right? Uh, he could build a single family home, put it up for sale, or rent it. Right? Or just find a buyer who wants the, the lot that does have beautiful trees. And you have to say that about it. Eh? Uh, just find a buyer and sell it to them, let them build a house. Eh? It's, uh, I mean, it isn't an either or. Eh? Yeah, it's either or, or, or. Eh? Uh, start looking at it that way. Eh? The other dimension of, of what I would want to say tonight is that it is deja vu all over again. All the issues that we raised before are largely unaddressed. Mm -hmm. uh, Geneva Beals cellar is still going to get more water. <laughs> uh, so my way of looking at it is more uh, a way of, uh, of looking at the physical geography of the lot. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that a point has been made repeatedly, well, there's plenty of room. Mm -hmm. Well, yes and no on that. Mm -hmm. Are you counting the square footage of the, the drainage area, the stream? Mm -hmm. Uh, are you counting uh, the setback requirements? Uh, it is a triangular lot, so there's an awful lot of that space that is not available right? but, uh, for construction. Right? So that, that number is a little bit deceiving, perhaps, <laughs> one should say, that, uh, when you look at it. So I think that, that uh, then all the issues uh, that we raised before, of course, in terms of headlights and, uh, but in terms of the physical geography of it, one other thing that I was thinking about is, is uh, was being talked earlier, is that if we have to build all these retaining walls, you're going to do a lot of excavation of that lot, hmm? which is going to, you know, again create different drainage problems, and I think that this, some of you began to fig figure out that there's a problem here hmm? uh, that has not been addressed anyway. Hmm? So for all of those reasons all put together, I would say uh, certainly uh, back off and say we got to have a lot more detail before we can make any judgment whatsoever. And as it stands, I would say vote it down. Any questions, <coughs> observations? Uh, next, we have Charlie Chamberlain. Ch 
Charlie Chamberlain. I, live, I own some property at uh, 560, 570, and 580, 590. I border uh, this lot. I, since this has come back the second time, there's really, what's been said by the folks already, I can't say much more. Uh, they've said, uh, they've talked about the water, the water coming down from Cedar Street. It isn't just this lot. It's the lot and the magnitude of what that brings plus. And anybody that doesn't think water, once hit concrete, is going to flow faster than on grass, it, it certainly is. Uh, there's a house down there that's it's going to suffer. It's it's absolutely going to suffer, and I, I don't think either one of these guys are going to come over and help bail it out. I, he asked a question about do they think, well, are they going to help? No. Uh, it seems like a lot of this is being put together on the fly here. The retaining walls, uh, the railings above the retaining walls. Uh, there's no concrete. I don't see anything that says this is definitely going to be done. Uh, we're going to do what the state asked me to do. That's all, maybe they will, maybe they won't once it gets passed. Uh, today's oh, been okay, tomorrow it's gonna rain. It's gonna rain hard. Uh, you folks need to go down and look at that, that drainage ditch and see what that drainage ditch, it'll probably bank. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Now add the volume that's gonna come down uh, even more. Uh, the green space slows it down, concrete won't. Uh, uh, I, I guess everything else, uh, the fire part, I did talk to the people in the fire department. And right now, you could drive a fire truck up in there. But now bring January and, and the snow and what it brings, it narrows the street up. Uh, there'll be cars parked there from Cedar Street. They come down, park there because they can't park on Cedar. It gets to be clogged. And uh, uh, there was multiple people saying in the January, snowy January, uh, you, you, you know, it could be a difficult situation getting a truck in there. Uh, safety should be uh, premier here. It really should. Um, the, the snow, uh, they're going to plow their snow. If you pass it, where? Uh, it can't come up Adam Street. It, it can't go toward Hickory. It can't go up the hill. So it's got to go down in that drainage ditch. And like last January with the rain, once again, it's going to be a problem. It, it, it's not a problem for anybody here, but there's going to be a problem for people there. That, that's what we got to concern ourselves with. The people that are living there currently and have been living there for 40 years. Um, I, I guess everything else has been talked about uh, by, <laughs> by everybody else here. I, uh, I, I was reading over uh, his other option uh, for you folks and uh, you know about the relationship, about uh, what it takes to get people in. In that, uh, uh, it's uh, that's uh, that's quite interesting reading. And uh, I've talked to some people that maybe own some of that kind of property, and uh, what happens there about relatives, and all of a sudden, how many people are in there? The volume is too much for the street in the neighborhood. Too many people, too many cars. It just, it's just too much. It's a dead end street, no way out when bad things happen, no way out when good things happen. Um, that's uh, pretty much, I, everything else has been stated. Uh, I've, had, I've had property there for 30 some years and uh, it's, it's been a good deal. Uh, there's been some additions, there's been some subtractions, but it's a nice looking area. You know, I'd like to keep it that way. Questions? Um. You were talking about traffic on uh, basically the bottom of Adams, correct? That they talking about where people are parking. Um, on your properties that you have, you do you have garages? Carports, two. Two. Um, number of tenants? Total for the two buildings? Yeah. Uh, Two, three, four, five, five. Okay. One duplex has uh, one on each side. The other duplex has a one and a two. Okay. So you you keep your properties pretty well maintained and everything. Drive down, take a look. Okay. Oh, I would assume you've done that already. Um, but there is a question about traffic and parking in that area. Am I it's correct? a dead end. It dead ends on a guardrail right there. It's a dead end. So obviously that's you know that's a. Okay. Is there some way that the city could 
help eliminate that problem? Make it a through street. Through the where? Uh, what about restricted parking? Restricted parking. Uh, there's a lot of restricted parking in this town. Uh, that's not a good thing. Yeah, restricted parking. You know, my mother-in-law has somebody come over that's uh, her age, and they park up the block uh, somewhere because they got a blown out knee or something and can't walk very far, and they get a ticket. What about so she got to buy a permit or something to come visit on Sunday after church? No, I'm no. not talking about that. Oh, okay. that's restricted parking? Uh, well, restricted parking can be a number of different things. I'm just worried uh, on some way of resolving this. So if your main concern is vehicles on the property or vehicles in the street, um, when, are the, when do you have that? During school? When, when school's on, sure. Do and when the park there overnight? Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. What if you restricted no overnight parking? <laughs> uh, that's not my job. Uh, well, I'm I, just saying they're, that I'm just throwing out options. So if there was uh, uh, restricted parking, no overnight parking, would that help eliminate the problem? No, I doubt it. Um, okay. When the parties hit, uh, you know the parties hit, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know if I particularly like restricted parking. It happened to my mother down across from the football stadium one year, and it was absolutely senseless. It's just that the college said, here, we're going to block this whole side of the street off. And like I say, then somebody after church on Sunday can't park there. You know? Uh, you understand what I'm saying? Well, I'm just saying this wouldn't be during the day. This would be during the evening hours. Who's, and who's going to police that? Well, what we have is our police. <laughs> Well, I'm just, what I'm trying to do is you're coming up with good ideas and good objections. My thinking is, is there a means to solve some of that so it would be applicable and everybody would come to a common ground? I don't think the space is there. I, I, I don't think the space is there to do what you want. It's a dead end street. I've got three driveways. Uh, there's people across the street, private, you know, homeowners. There just isn't space there. There's too many driveways. It just isn't there. Okay. That, okay. I appreciate your answers. Thank sure. you very much. Well, thank you. Okay, and uh, the final person is Carol Beals speaking for Geneva or... Good evening, my name is Carol Beals. I'm representing Geneva Beals. She owns the property at four, or Beals Trust, I guess, four, 475 North Hickory. So it butts up to the west of the designated property. Um, you know, here we are again. It's been voted down twice at the Planning Commission, once at the City Council. Nothing's really changed. The lot size hasn't gotten bigger. It hasn't gotten square. It hasn't gotten higher. It hasn't fixed the runoff. All the same concerns have been brought up repeatedly tonight. I find it interesting that a couple of the things that you've brought up from a real estate perspective, Mr. Nall, is that you think restricted parking will help if, but where are you gonna put the cars? If he's gonna have one building and not put garages up and he's gonna get away with it, then that makes him, in my opinion, not such a great landlord. He sat in front of the planning commission and he specifically said he would have garages, did he not, Barb? that he would have all the stuff put away, and that he was very particular about how he took care of his tenants, that he made them keep the buildings looking nice. Now he's standing here saying, if you don't give me the two duplexes with the garages and $1,200 a month, I'm gonna build a s much less of a building and I'm gonna put as many people in it as I want. If you're either a good landlord and want respectable tenants, and for $1,200, I would not rent a facility for $1,200 that did not have a garage. Shutters, nobody's really going to see them. I hate to tell you that. It's not a dead-end street. Um, 
he comes back with one building with eight people or two buildings with eight people. I'll take the one building with eight people, but I'd really take one house that was a decent sized house that people would enjoy and bring families back into the neighborhood. If you go north on Hickory, you have nothing but families. Do I have my directions? Yeah, north on Hickory, you have nothing but families. And going towards the university, then you do have rental property. But the Ballwigs are here tonight. They're not rental. They're property owners. Mrs. Pittington isn't a rental. She's a property owner. The Whitakers aren't rentals. They're property owners. Go on up the street. I mean, I think we've hashed this and hashed it over time and time again. I have no understanding as to why we're back here today, except that maybe Mr. Carroll or Mr. Crowfoot thought it would be a good idea to restrict how many people could be in a unit. They don't have to live there. They can't change the size of the locks, lots. They can't change any of the same things that have been pointed out repeatedly to this council. Um, Mr. Wadig is either a good landlord or he's not. And if he's not, we'll be back here telling the city to enforce the rules on his one student housing property that he shoves all the students in. If there's trash outside my house, you have no problem coming over and telling me to get it put away. I would expect you to do the same for him and for everybody else in this community. I would respectfully ask that you deny this again and that this building is put to rest and that we're done with this issue once and for all. So, Mr. Wadey, if you don't like two of them, go ahead and put your one structure up. You've got that right. Thank you. Okay, that uh, is all. The, that's the total number of people that have registered uh, against. I have not had anybody register with a public statement in general. So now we're to the part for council discussion. So does anyone have questions? Joe, I do have a question. This property is currently zoned? R2. R2. And what, uh, what are the restrictions, requirements? What are the, um, for an R2? Um. Well, the, I guess the relevant part is this lot could be used as it currently sits for either a single family or a duplex. Okay, so as it currently, so it couldn't be used for more than a duplex right now. Correct. Or a single family, okay? Correct. And is there a limited occupancy district there in that neighborhood now? No. So there's no Arlo there. And if a property is deterrent, it does come under the Arlo, which mine is, by the way, uh, designation, can I request it be changed? Or how does that, I mean, the, you know, it's one thing to designate it residential lim limited occupancy <coughs> this year, but then is there, what's the requirement relative to if I then come in and say, geez, I don't want to be Arlo anymore? The uh, overlay district is considered a, basically a rezoning, so you would have to go through that process to either designate it or undesignate it. And somebody did make that request uh, a few years ago to have it removed, and they had to go through that process, and it was actually denied. Right, I think that was up on Union Street. Correct. Yep, pretty much remember that. Those were my questions. Does anybody else have questions? Questions or comments? This is the time. <coughs> and anything? No. Um, the RLO would have to be basically a petition from the owner. Uh, well, in this case, the, the owner has indicated that he would be yeah. willing to have that designation placed on his property. But the city couldn't impose that on, on any of the neighbors. Uh, actually, the city can change zoning on a property without the property owner's permission. Make it RLO? Yes. But the one on over at uh, 
Preston Drive and Moonlight Drive and Perry Drive, they brought a petition. Correct. About 111 people. Thank you. Well, uh, if there's no more discussion, then I think we're to the point where we're at number seven. Are you ready to close this public hearing? I move to close the public hearing. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Barb Stockhausen and a second by Ken Killian to close the public hearing. We'll vote. Westby? Yes. Dawes? Yes. Francis? Yes. Stockhausen? No. You don't want to close the public hearing? Oh, yes. I do <laughs> want to close the public hearing. Killian? Yes. And now? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. The next item on the agenda is Common Council Action. I move we deny the request to create a PUD. I have a motion. Do I have a second? To deny the request for a PUD. Well, that motion dies for lack of a second. Are there any other motions? Can I have clarification? Um, this is a public hearing concerning the ordinance. Um, <coughs> is this where we actually vote on whether we're going to allow this or not? Amending the zoning map for a planned unit development, yes. Okay. So. I'll make a motion that we go ahead and amend the. Uh, <laughs> zoning map for this and to make it a limited occupancy zoning and that um, it, once it's passed then we will have another hearing or there will be another uh, meeting to discuss what needs to be done am I correct Joe um, if, if this, the general development plan is, includes the, the change of the zoning to PUD, if that is approved, they would come back in with the SIP we approval. Talk about all the and I suspect things. at that time we would also have an ordinance to designate the limited occupancy overlay district. We would do it in conjunction with the SIP. Okay. And you made some recommendations, am I correct? Correct. Forgive me, I lost my page here. Page 89. Yeah, those recommendations could be included in the SIP if we get to that. Okay. That part. So we don't do not need to include those at the present time. Not unless you feel the need to. Um. Well, it's probably better that we do. So I'll make the motion along with uh, it being in a limited occupancy zoning that, um, that it be a planned unit development and that um, sidewalks connecting the parking areas to the building and the streets and there should be a standard height of the retaining walls and fencing to um, limit anybody from accidentally if the retaining walls are too high so they don't fall. And landscaping and screening. Um, and then additional information on building design and materials will be provided uh, at that time when they come back. Also, um, at that time, we can discuss if there's any uh, exterior features that need to be added. Okay, Tom has made a motion to approve the PUD, including our low designation, and to uh, consider the recommendations that may, were made by staff 
Tom, you didn't talk about on-site parking, but you did talk about sidewalks, retaining walls, fences, landscaping, screening, and building design and materials. That's correct. And you left out par the parking. Yes, I did. Okay. So Tom has made this motion. Do I have a second for this motion? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the PUD general development plan, including designation as an Arlo district or Arlo property and uh, recommendations. I'm going to call them from the list of five that were presented by staff, number uh, the four, not the first one, but uh, two through five. Is everybody clear on the motion? Okay, we'll vote. Westby? Yes. Doss? No. Francis? No. Stackhausen? No. Killian? No. No? Yes. Motion fails. Thank you. And uh, we'll now move on with our agenda. The next item on our agenda is consideration of the consent calendar. The following items may be approved on a single motion and vote due to their routine nature or previous discussion. If you want uh, something uh, separated from this uh, group, please let me know. There's the council minutes from uh, June 13th, both the regular and special meeting, payment of bills. There are no appointments to boards or committees and licenses tonight, uh, a junk dealer license, and one and two year operator licenses to serve alcohol. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the consent calendar. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion from Ken and a second from Catherine to approve the consent calendar. We'll vote. Westby? Yes. Doss? Yes. Francis? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Killian? Yes. No? Yes. <coughs> motion carries. Okay, I have. Uh, Nobody that has requested to speak under citizens' observations, comments, or petitions. So we'll go on to reports. <coughs> um, there were several reports included. Uh, Police and Fire Commission, Eileen is not here. Community Safe Routes, Don, anything to add? Not right now. I have a question. Okay. Do you have a cut? Does the trail include in this commission, in this uh, unit? Is the committee? trail part of the Safe Right Routes Committee purview? Well, I'm concerned about it, sure. I should talk to Parks and Rec. I was wondering if a yellow path can be someday when there's money. Someday. Somewhere two, three years down the road, if there's money, if a yellow line can be put on that path, the trail. I would like to separate right one from left. right from left. Okay, well maybe that can be, somebody can forward that to the trail people. I don't, I don't know anything about it, but. Well, okay. I'm forwarding that to the committee and you can forward it on I'm to the trail. I'm not on the committee anymore. Oh, oh. oh you okay. are. I am now, yes. Okay. okay, so this is from before. Right. 3-7, okay. yeah, when he was still on. Okay, Catherine. I will be okay. to the But I would suggest talking to Jean Weber. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Museum board. I don't know, Catherine, that used to be you. No, now. It is you. It, yes. <laughs> I don't have anything to add to that except uh, Heritage Day, which will be on July 4th from 9 to 4, and it's free, so make sure you check out the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museum on the Excellent. 4th. There's always good ice cream. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Historic Preservation Commission, Ken. I have no addition. Uh, there is a meeting that's coming Thursday night, the 29th, to look at the um, agreement, and it's what at the police station at 5:30 or 6. Five o'clock. Five. Five. Mm -hmm. Five. And it's open to the public. It is. Right. Okay. okay. Thank Can you. I speak then? Oh, do you have any more to say, Ken? <laughs> do you want do? to speak more about the Historic Preservation Commission? Yes. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I have a concern that as this the questions are coming now more uh, the Historic Preservation Commission needs to have all its members present so I think 
the last few years, one or two members didn't take it serious enough to come to the meetings. And so I would just like to ask you to ask the... To come to the Thursday night meeting? Come to no, the Thursday, to, to come to your regular meetings, I to think. To regular meetings. That to our regular meeting? They need to be there. And I've got a feeling that over the years... Well, um, last time was very good. I believe they were all there except one. Okay. All right, uh, library board. Uh, Eileen is not here, but the library opened today. <coughs> I know there was a sneak preview last week on Saturday, Friday? Friday and Saturday. Friday and this. Saturday, and today the library opened for business. And I've he heard great comments from the people that have been in, so I highly suggest people uh, go in and read a book or look at a magazine or whatever. Water and Sewer Commission, Killian. Can I make a comment about the library board or the sure, library? Sure, the library, sure. Right, um, the university is, is uh, hosting students for the engineering camp and one of the professors has now directed some of the students to go to the library and look at um, design. So it's gonna be used for study with the university. So I just wanted to make that aware. So you're going to have high school students that are gonna evaluate that building, which is the best way to advertise. Right. Okay, Water and Sewer Commission, Killian Knoll or Stockhausen? No addition on my part. Parks, Forestry, Recreation, Don, is that you or not? It is me now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we, uh, we have one vacancy, so we're still looking for one more person to be added to it. Okay. What is this softball thing coming up? Not in the agenda someplace? Softball thing. The, the batting character? It's in information and discussion later on. Yeah, that's an yeah, information item. It's not on. <coughs> okay, Commission on Aging? Um, just want to add that the <coughs> next Commission on Aging meeting um, will be actually at OE Gray. Oh. Okay. We're going to review the facilities and have a good idea of what uh, is there. So um, we're very enthused about that. So just want everybody to know that uh, that's what we're going to be doing. Okay. All right, now we can move into our action items. The first action item is the land donation, Lot 21, Oak Haven subdivision. Uh, is this Joe or Howard or Luke? Yeah. Luke, I see you hiding back there now. Uh, I'll, I'll start and pass it off as needed. Um, lot 21, Oak Haven subdivision, uh, is a vacant lot still owned by Bob Cody, the developer of that subdivision. Um, he had the original intent, obviously, of developing that lot, started to fill it. Um, I think uh, realized it was too steep to uh, really be feasible to build a house on. So it's been sitting there empty for a few years, obviously. Um, since he doesn't feel it feasible to build on, he suggested uh, the idea to me of donating it to the city since the city has some land that we own to the back of that lot. It's part of the open space where that trail comes up. Um, so we took it through the, the process, Planning Commission, Parks, Forestry, Recreation Commission, and now to the council. Um, the city really doesn't have any viable use for that property due to the slope. Uh, it's not really uh, going to be a site that's a recreational area. It would be an open space area similar to the rest of that area uh, back there. Um, the neighbors have s expressed some concerns about the, the weeds and the uh, condition of the fill, and they're here to speak about that, or at least one person is. Um, so it would just be an open space uh, parcel for us. Um, the plan commission had reviewed this. Um, they recommended denial. Uh, I think uh, a couple of conditions. One is since there really wasn't a use for it, and the uh, the condition of what would have to be done to the the property before we would uh, take it on. But they seemed open to the idea. There were some alternatives suggested to them about maybe a combination of the city would take part and the, the neighbors would take part, which uh, was a they primarily wanted to get some feedback from the Parks, Forestry, Recreation Committee on what their idea was, and I didn't attend that meeting, so I'll let Howard um, fill in the details of their recommendation. Sure. 
Um, there was a special meeting by the Parks, Forestry, and Recreation Committee on site, uh, and at that meeting, the committee approved a, a motion to recommend that uh, the city accept the property only if the current owner, Mr. Cody, cleans it, cleaning meaning re removal of foreign matter and dead trees, um, um, and one of the other items was that we had talked with, uh, uh, with Mr. Schmidt, he's the gentleman who's here today, um, if the council decides to accept the property, um, we, we were uh, suggesting that maybe we look at um, doing a quick claim deed to uh, transfer the flat area, the mobile area only to one or more of the neighbors like Mr. Schmidt. Um, the remaining area, if we accepted it, would be uh, wild, natural, no maintenance involved. And that would uh, reduce staff's concern regarding uh, costs of ongoing maintenance of this. Okay, I do have a question. When it says removal of dead trees and foreign matter. Um, the, the issue here is that, uh, as, as Joe had stated, um, Mr. Cody had been using that for, for a fill site. Um, so there's... Um, not just um, not just soil there, but there's all sorts of construction debris that's in there. Some of it is near the surface, and um, you know you can see some of the those materials near the surface. Um, and I believe that the uh, Parks, Forestry, and Recreation Committee wanted to make sure that. Uh, anything that was visible, anything that that's not suitable for uh, having um, for having um, black dirt on the top for growing, um, be removed from that site first before we accept it. Okay, anybody other questions of staff? Otherwise, we have had Mr. Schmidt uh, who wants to speak on this issue, the land mm -hmm. lot 21. I sure, yeah, you can ask a question. <clears throat> Did you talk to Mr. Cody about the possibility of cleaning it up for the city to accept it? I did not. Uh, I, I mentioned to him that that was a concern that was raised. Um, one sub suggestion, I guess, that he had made was rather than trying to remove that fill, which would be very difficult, uh, instead to place additional uh, black dirt on top of the, you know, exposed concrete or whatever is there, so that you could get, you know, suitable growth o over it. Was he willing to um, accept that uh, expense? Uh, we did not get into the details, so I do not know the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, I, I did also uh, suggest, uh, you know, describe to him the, the suggestion that came up of, you know, splitting the parcel in some form or fashion and sharing with the, the adjoining property owners. And he, of course, said, I have no concern with that, but I don't know how to go about that, so he would prefer that the city at least do the the legwork on how to do that. And also we did not talk about any expense of doing that. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Is this at the end of which drive? <clears throat> My name is Bruce Schmidt. I live at 190 West Norwood which is the property immediately adjacent to the property in question. Um, may I ask the council, are you familiar with this publication? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you know what page 10 is about? Keep 
Platteville, Beautiful and Safe. And it's a description of the municipal code regarding noxious weeds, overgrown grass, weeds, trees, other plants, to such a degree that it tends to depreciate the appearance of the neighborhood. Noxious weeds and debris. It also, the article here indicates that our code, code enforcement staff conduct both proactive and reactive inspections. During previous testimony to, I believe it was the Planning Commission, program staff indicated that only reactive inspection is used relative to this property. As a result, Mr. Cody has used the better part of the last 10 years. That's how long I have been there. In violation of these codes, with very little sanction. This article goes on to say, what can you do to help? Well, it says, no property within the city may be used or maintained in a manner which downgrades the value, use, enjoyment, or safety of one's own or surrounding property. Now, it occurs to me, and it, it is not, I, I want to be as respectful as I possibly can, because I thank you all for your time and your work on behalf of this city. But I'm also asking you to help create an environment within this city that allows what you're talking about here. If there is only reactive inspection or sanction, that means that every time I want Mr. Cody to mow his lawn, I have to call someone. And what happens? He sends over someone with a zero turn 52 inch mower, and do you know where all of the seeds go? To my yard. Please be let me be clear. That only happens three times a year. Mr. Nall, Tom, I, I hate to put you on the spot, but you live in the same neighborhood. Is anything that I have said a misstatement or an exaggeration? No. Thank you. Ms. Stockhausen, are, you are aware that at my own expense, mm -hmm. I have taken care of the entire easement section adjacent to my property and turned it into a garden area that the city would be proud to have. My point here, and further, just this year, I finally take it upon myself, municipal code irrespective, I have mowed Mr. Cody's lawn as a self-defense mechanism. So when you go over to look at the property, it looks very nice now. So please don't be misled. There are four dead trees. I've counted them this morning because I knew this committee we're hearing was going to happen. I think that the black dirt is an acceptable alternative to me. That's up to the city to decide. But once again, what I am asking you to do is to help create an environment in the city that allows citizens like myself who are concerned about property values, about codes, about the way things look, and the surrounding neighborhood in which I live. I am very proud to be there. Let us do something. I, I ask you to accept the donation with some minor cleanup. But please, when you, when you make the motion, that it not be simply a black and white yes or no accept the donation, but when you make the motion, include the concept of the contingency. 
because to me they're they're they're, they're integrally related. The donation by itself is not a, just a standalone. Once again, thank you for your time and for listening to me this third or fourth time. I'm losing count. But I, what occurred to me was I wasn't going to speak tonight. But when I stopped by outside, I found this publication. This is, this is what you want everyone to be doing in this city. Help me do it. Bruce, Bruce. Yes. You're still interested in uh, quit claim? I would be happy to accept a quit claim deed. Okay. Ind independently or in collaboration with neighbors, however it works out. You just want the eyesore removed. I do, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Schmidt was the only person who uh, requested to speak. Um, do I have further council discussion? What part of this property is the quick claim on? Is it just the road frontage? Um, that, the that, was, part or? that would be the intent is the road frontage part, the, the flat part that is a manicured lawn of sorts. Um, not the not the steep wooded area um, that that would be the intent uh, we staff did not go any farther than to see whether that was possible um, pending <coughs> council's action and direction if you decided to deny this request for a donation I didn't want to spend a lot of staff time and effort trying to go through a procedure if if you were going to reject the donation so is there two parts here the quick claim option and the donation or one or the other what what I, I, I don't know it would seem to me that the first that it would be one motion to start with and that motion would be I mean this is not just accepting a piece of property right this is accepting a piece of property with conditions and with requirements um so i mean i it, it, it's possible that the landowner might say hey i don't want to clean it up i don't want to put any black dirt on it i'm not taking out the foreign material and at that rate then we there would not be a quick claim deed needed i mean so it seems to me that one part hit the one part here is to decide whether or not to accept the property and under what conditions to accept it and the second part is then to decide what to do with it and authorize staff to work with surrounding neighbors to dispose or get deed to or whatever does that seem reasonable Karen? another potential approach would be um, to sort of outline the vision which could be that what was out what was described before the flat part going yeah. to the neighbor and the remainder of the lot going to the city under the following types of conditions and then direct staff yeah. to um to proceed to see if that uh, an agreement can be reached with the current owner as well as um the gentleman in the audience tonight so so it could just be staff direction to proceed yeah So does anybody have any additional questions? Or are we ready to have a motion? Um, <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion that we accept the donation with certain conditions. Those conditions being that at least the present owner uh, put black dirt to cover up all the uh, expose concrete and flatten it out because there is mounds of just dirt and gravel and also that the dead trees be removed and who's and that's at the direction of that's at the direction of 
<laughs> the the <clears throat> actually direction of both the park and rest staff, staff. Right. staff. <laughs> okay and then what are the staff supposed to do with this after they get well, it Tom <laughs> they are supposed to take it and review it and explain it to the um, landowner and if the landowner agrees then we will take possession and at that time the city staff can work with the neighbors to decide <coughs> if they want to put claim the deed over also if the um, <clears throat> if the owner of the property doesn't want to keep it clean um, and updated and removed then I think um, there is certain uh, elements that the subdivision can take care of that. So we have a motion, I believe, to accept this donation of property after this property has been adequately cleaned, uh, which might include removal of some things, including removal dead tr trees and dead maybe metal or anything else they find on this site anything that would be exposed um, that okay and then covering it with black, black dirt. dirt and leveling the whole area so we don't have a bunch <coughs> of undulating okay and then after that uh, staff would be directed to uh, do that and then they would work with the neighborhood can I ask a question if the quick claim is is mandatory as part of accepting the property or is that something to be negotiated after the property is accepted? That would be um, something that I know I would like to include it that there be a quick claim deed. Thank you. Okay. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Gonna... Very good. Ken seconds it. Now we can vote. Westby? Yes. Doss? Yes. Francis? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Killian? Yes. No? Yes. Motion carries. All right, the next uh, action item on our agenda is the resolution 1715 approving the 2016 compliance maintenance annual report the CMAR yes um, this is an annual uh, report required to be submitted by June 30th to the DNR it's a self report on the condition of our treatment plant the collection system uh, and other uh, uh, aspects of our wastewater uh, system um, and um, it's based on criteria established by the DNR uh, and our system is graded in A in a perfect a, a perfect rating across the board and so um, I recommend that the council approve the resolution to uh, transmit uh, to, and submit the uh, CMAR for 2016 I, I most make a motion that we accept this report, the CMAR 2016 report. And submitted to the DNR. Yes, thank you. I'll second. Uh, we'll vote. Westby? Yes. Doss? Yes. Francis? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Killian? Yes. Null? Yes. Motion carries. All right, that's the end of the action items on our agenda. So let's move on to the information items, the first of which is downtown parking task overview, followed by downtown parking task recommendations and those kinds of things. I think this is, I think we can probably roll all of this together in one A and B. Yes, yes, yes. I think we can. Um, so I'm going to give just a brief overview of um, the progress with respect to the downtown parking task force. Um, some of this presentation will look familiar because we uh, did 
portions of it when we established the, the parking task force last year. So just to kind of remind people that historic downtowns have some unique features to them. Um, they were built in a different era. They're not really designed to accommodate today's auto-centric uh, environment. Um, you've got a lot of different uses uh, in a concentrated area. They were the original mixed-use uh, development. Um, and the uses in, in downtowns tend to evolve over time, and that causes shifting dynamics within the district itself. Uh, the downsides are also you uh, have shared parking arrangements, meaning that you've got multiple property owners that are relying on street or common parking areas for their businesses or, or apartments. And uh, because of all these factors, you tend to see more public sector involvement in parking in downtown areas than, than you would in a, a newer development. Um, so, of course, what makes uh, downtowns challenging also makes them incredibly unique and increasingly popular destinations. And so, uh, because of some changing dynamics in our downtown, uh, concerns were brought up uh, last year uh, about parking. And as I understand it, um, there have been concerns brought up parking probably many years. Um, uh, so we were anticipating that there would be significant construction uh, last year, this year, and, and next year, and probably into 2019 as well. Um, we were going to start to see some lane and parking closures to accommodate all of that construction. There'll be dust and noise and shifts in parking. Um, and then we were also going to see some intensification of use uh, near Chestnut and Maine with uh, the construction of the library block project and then the potential uh, Steve's Pizza uh, brew pub development. And so um, one of the things that, uh, that uh, the task force recommended and, and um, UWP engineering design students ultimately did was a, a parking study. And one of the things that they looked at was specifically that issue of intensification at the, in the area near Chestnut and Maine. So just a, a quick reminder of uh, kind of what we asked the parking task force to do. Uh, we wanted them to sort of look at uh, review existing time space allocations, make it recommendations for adjustments, um, develop a methodology for soliciting feedback from the broader public with respect to proposed parking changes, draft an education campaign with respect to employee parking, make recommendations regarding signing and marketing of existing city owned lots, um, review the layout and configuration of those lots, identify underutilized private parking in the area for joint uh, possible joint parking arrangements. Uh, make recommendations with respect to parking enforcement and identify possible future locations of surface parking lots. Um, they did not do all of these items. It, that's a pretty big list. Um, but I'm going to review kind of the progress that's been made to date. And I do think to some degree uh, there isn't a ton of energy perhaps to pursue uh, some of these additional items as a group. I do think that there was a lot of concern at the time Steve's Pizza, the Steve's Pizza uh, project was being considered. Um, and, and one of the things I guess I've learned is that um, if there's not an immediate issue before people, um, you know, they tend to be busy and they want to spend their time doing other things. So I do think that the staff has some capacity uh, to be able to advance some of these objectives. Um, and then to test it uh, potentially with that group or with Main Street. Um, so the task force did end up, whoops, did end up meeting eight times. Um, you can see the members listed there. It was very difficult to get all of the members um, to two meetings, and we did have one member that only attended once. Um, and again, we did have the UWP design team coming in and helping to support the project. So one of the things that I do think that uh, will, is a notable outcome from from the task force is sort of general guiding principles for the downtown. Um, and so looking at users, and users are defined here as customers, residents, employees, that users should be able to access downtown through a variety of transportation options, driving, biking, walking, transit, and that we keep these in mind. Um, customers should be able to find parking within three blocks of their destination, employees within five blocks, um, and that parking on, on Main Street um, from Water to Elm, and then between the cross streets, Pine and Mineral, is generally, the on-street parking in that zone generally be reserved for customers only. 
Um, also, that when making decisions regarding parking, the needs of the downtown district should carry more weight than the needs of any, needs of any one individual business. And to the extent possible, existing public and private parking lots should be shared to maximize use during day and evening hours. Uh, moving on, um, parking options should be clearly posted using outdoor signs. Customers and residents should be able to easily access information about parking on Main Street, City of Platteville websites, and businesses and landlords should have a commitment to communicate parking requirements and options to both their employees and their tenants. Um, downtown, and this is a notable one, I think, um, downtown residents should not expect free overnight parking unless provided by the landlord. To the extent possible, public Par parking options should be made available for downtown residents and landlords at a reasonable cost. And then lastly, existing parking lots should be brought up to retail standards before investing in additional parking lots. So as I said before, we did uh, engage the students um, in looking at uh, the impact of some of the upcoming and rec recently completed development. Um, and so they evaluated current parking usage, pedestrian traffic in the downtown area. They evaluated the effect of the future development, both the Library Block and Pioneer Ford and Steve's Pizza, um, and how, what impact that would have on parking and traffic flow. Um, they conducted a survey of downtown users to understand concerns about parking and where they're parking today. Um, and then they provided some recommendations. Uh, we do have all the complete synopsis of that study that happy to share with you and, and we can post it on our website as well. Um, I will say that the findings were generally very, very similar um, to a previous 2012 study in that they determined that adequate parking existed even with the proposed uh, new developments coming online um, and that also uh, traffic signaling, et cetera, were, were adequate to accommodate um, higher, higher levels of traffic with the exception of 24 hour parking or that resident parking and that continues to be an, the shortfall area. So the downtown task force uh, had some recommendations and um, these were included in your packet today. But I, I am gonna say that we're gonna be asking you to table all but two of these um, tonight. Um, I think Howard and I would acknowledge <laughs> We, we rushed this a little bit um, because we wanted to get this information at the same time you were getting the Mineral Street bid and the possible configuration of that, that lot. Um, now that uh, it appears that the Mineral Street bid is, is too high to complete this year, um, we're anticipating that you're going to defer it till next year, which gives us a little more time. And when we went back and we looked at the downtown map, um, we realize that we have a few other areas we really need to include as part of this overall package. I think we did a little bit what people tend to do with downtown and that even though we were trying to look at the big picture, we didn't go quite big enough. Um, and we looked at some of these changes in isolation and now we can see some other tweaks that could be made that would both reduce the number of parking categories we have um, and and potentially deal with if you do decide you want to move to some paid parking in our public lots um, to kind of deal with um, what the, some potential consequences from that might be. So uh, the senior design team did make uh, four main recommendations. One was, again, the 24-hour leased parking in the mineral and post office lots. That wouldn't be the entire lot, but a portion of those lots. Um, converting parking on the west side of Bonson Street, uh, which would be across from City Hall, from city business to three-hour timed parking. Making Third Street between Main and Furnace Streets a one-way northbound, which would add 10 parking stalls on the east side of the street. And then adding a pedestrian crossing on Chestnut Street at Furnace Street. Uh, the task force had a couple of additional recommendations, which uh, included adding time stalls on Mar Market Street and reconfiguring the Mineral Street lot as part of the Mineral Street reconstruction. Uh, we have been working a little bit on that concept of marketing, again, because we were gearing up towards this idea of, of a redone um, city lot. And so you can see that Jody uh, redid a, a logo for us that would help to better idea, identify where public parking is. I think it, as somebody who came in as an outsider, I think it's very confusing to identify the public from private area. 
Um, you can also see some additional examples of what marketing material could look like targeted towards different audiences to kind of explain what the quote unquote rules or guiding principles are when you're dealing with uh, in the downtown environment and employers could use it as tools with employees or landlords could use it as tools um, with tenants. And then this was uh, the, a slide that we had shared last year and we've talked about before, but I think there's this idea that, you know, why haven't we solved the downtown parking problem? And I would pose that you never really solve the downtown parking problem. You know, as again, as uses change, as, um, you know, it shifts the dynamic and you have to reevaluate, or as an area intensifies, um, sometimes it can just be a, a high a high traffic business to a lower traffic business that can can result in changes. Have, having a parking ha, continuing to have these parking discussions is really a sign that your downtown is doing okay. If you if you can drive up in front of every business you want to go to in, in your downtown district, your downtown's in trouble. And so then again with that, I think we are just recommending that perhaps for this evening you consider items three and four um, and that the rest are tabled. And then what we would propose is that we would prepare information for an open house and then probably send out a letter to all the businesses and residents in the downtown district inviting them um, to review the changes attend the open house and to give additional feedback before we bring it back. Okay, so you would like us to look at, in more detail tonight for information, the Bonson Street parking reassignment. Oops. I'm sorry, four and five, Oops. my mistake. Okay. Well, going um, I down think the list, post office parking lot. Um, I'm looking at the agenda list and. The agenda. The, the agenda, number four is a crosswalk which I don't think will be terribly controversial. And the other one is the Market Street parking reassignment, which was a specific request that had come from a business that they've been waiting on for quite a while that the committee did feel was warranted. And uh, can I believe that one, two, three, and six are things that you want to continue to discuss and then bring back. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Right. And when are they coming back? After so we would prepare, so what we've discovered is we've got more work to do, so I think there will be additional items on this list. And then we would prepare materials for an open house or some sort of opportunity for the public to give additional feedback um, and then send out a letter letter to the residents, businesses downtown. So I'm guessing this is gonna take us a few months to accomplish. Oh, and then we'll bring it back to you. This fall? I'm hoping sooner, uh -huh. but, but probably, I think August, September is realistic. Yeah. I guess two months would be this fall. So do we wanna then, uh, Karen has asked us to take a look at four and five as information items that might be moved to action items at a subsequent meeting. So let's, uh, let's not look at post office parking lot modifications, third street modifications, Bonson Street parking reassignments, but let's start by having some kind of uh, discussion or over, are you gonna do that, Karen, on the crosswalk on Chestnut Street at Mineral Street? This would be by the Episcopal Church, is that right? Mm -hmm. Do I have it about right? Um, a little bit south of there. Um, the, uh, um, there's the Martin Schwartz Funeral Home and the bank parking lot. Sure. That's okay. Mineral Street that runs between them. Um, I, I guess I can go ahead and get going. One of the, one of the things that the student uh, group found was that uh, there are a number of people, primarily students, who uh, cross there instead of going down to the traffic signal 
to cross in order to get from housing, uh, you know, uh, rental housing over to the campus. So they were saying their recommendation was that's where the students are, are, are walking, that's where they're going, let's place a crosswalk there so that um, we can identify that for people who are driving so that they can be aware that people are, have a tendency to cross there and hopefully they will uh, be watching for people and, and uh, make that area a little bit safer for people to cross there. Um, I have a question for you, uh, Howard. Would we be able to put um, signs close by so people would know that there's a crosswalk? The, the intent would be to uh, place crosswalk signs on the north and south side okay. and to uh, paint crosswalk lines uh, basically from the uh, funeral home side on the north side of Mineral over to the north side. Uh, there's a private home there um, as, the, uh, as the solution for that. Okay, thank what you. What about flashing lights? We've talked about those. The intent was not to do that. Um, I mean, the, there is a, a larger expense for something like that. Um, you know, we already have signal signalized crosswalk 300 feet south at uh, Main Street. Um, people being people, they don't necessarily want to walk that extra 300 feet to do that. I don't know that it would be cost effective for us to be trying to put in um, uh, flashing crosswalk at that location. But you, do you expect people to stop for the crosswalk? They're already stopping. I drive there for, twice a for day. that at that place. Wisconsin law is that uh, drivers are supposed to yield to pedestrians in a crosswalk. So, if we have a designated crosswalk there, um, I, I'm not. A police officer, but I would expect that that would be an enforceable action at that point. My next question is um, what about <clears throat> serving bar time closure? Where are people now traveling from the bars to get back toward campus? I'm not awake at bar time myself, so I'm not sure well, where the police, they're actually the police, going. Some of the police ought to be awake at bar time. <coughs> if they go. They're coming. They're coming on Mineral Street, right? So this crosswalk is going to serve bar time as well. Is that correct? Well, I, I would speak uh, to a couple of things here. As a as a police officer, my observations were that they would go through City Park or on Main Street. Market Street is just that much more further north to get across Chestnut Street. This is Mineral. Or, mineral. Oh, mineral. mineral. Mineral Street. Oh, mineral. I, excuse so me. Right yeah, uh, the bar. yeah, they go right through City Park, so they cross there. Yes. So it's serve also. So the it's bar. main main crossings are uh, Main Street and the Mineral Street. So maybe at bar time they would have flashing lights. Two and that could be quite as alert. Is. Uh, my suggestion would be no flashing lights as with flashing lights are they going to detract from the other intersection mm -hmm. it's confusing. Uh, uh, this is a state highway are there regulations relative to the installation <coughs> of crosswalks on a state highway particularly a state highway that has a signal light in the next two blocks i that's a question i would have and I would hope that there would be some answer to that um, prior to any um, discussion. On it. The other thing, uh, or any voting on it, the other thing is, is I believe in the downtown area we have these little floppy <laughs> yellow signs in the middle of the street. Do we? I mean, don't those say there's a cross? I mean, 
that they put out in front of Garvey's and there's other places they go out? Yes, there, there are a couple of those uh, movable signs that people put out. Um, local business uh, voluntarily puts those out during the day. Um, it, it's just another indicator to try to alert the traffic of the crosswalks and what they're supposed to do. Um, if there was a local business or a homeowner that wanted to do that, um, I, I don't see that as a, as a problem. Uh, it's just that I don't know that the city would have the resources to be doing that on a daily basis uh, at, at that point. I was just thinking that as you install a new crosswalk, that's a way to alert people to a change that has just happened mm -hmm. on in 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 a place that perhaps hasn't seen a lot of change. Howard, um, speed limit there is 25 miles per hour. Correct. On Main Street, it's 15 miles per hour. Correct. Does the state limit if we put a 15 from mile per hour segment in there? I, I'm, not, I'm just asking. I'm not saying to do it. I'm just asking. I would have to look at the regulations, but I believe that a uh, reduction in speed on, on that would have to be uh, warranted through a speed study and, and, and other things. And quite frankly, I don't know that that would be warranted in that area. Okay, that's all right. I was just asking. Okay, well, um, if you have, I think in the instance of time, unless somebody has another pressing question on this, um, let's uh, make sure that you have your questions answered and we'll move this up to uh, the action item list for next time. This would be the cro a crosswalk installation on North Chestnut at West Mineral. Now let's go on to the next item, which was the Market Street parking reassignment. Yeah. Um, there was an initial request by a local business and the Downtown Parking Task Force reviewed that request and they are recommending that the city designate up to four parking stalls as three hour parking, uh, 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., no parking, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Those are similar to the signs that we have uh, throughout the downtown area uh, and the idea would be uh, on Market Street, that's on the north side of City Park, those angled parking stalls, we would be looking, the recommendation is to do that for the four parking stalls uh, at the very northwest corner of, of the park uh, by the corner of Market and Park Place. So everybody looked at that on there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I, I do have a question. It seems to me that I have been in that area when there is a funeral at the Martin Schwartz Funeral Home and that they either must request from the city or something, but I have, I believe, seen not only what a Market Street, but also the street in front of the funeral home uh, blocked off or whatever for funeral only parking it has been a tradition uh, there really hasn't been any uh, policy or anything like that generated but uh, as a courtesy for the families and and all like that um, they have in fact placed um, small signs in those stalls requesting people uh, respect that those spaces be designated for, you know, funeral party. Uh, uh, we have not tr attempted to enforce it or remove those or do anything like that. It's been more or less a, a tacit tradition that we've been doing. And so these stalls would then 
be within that area, so I'm assuming that these stalls would be subject to the same gentleman's agreement. Or I've not uh, gone through that, but I, I would think so that uh, they would also be subject to that uh, tacit agreement. On the south side of Market Street, the two parking spots, uh, which would be on the north side of the funeral home, uh, do they use those as well uh, for uh, funeral parking? I believe they do. Okay. Yeah. Howard, do you know what the time limit is um, as far as parking next to Garvey's standard or Garvey station? Is that two hours, three hours? What is that? Um, I would have to look at that. I'd it's three hours. Three hour parking. Three hours? Yep. That would be the same? Yes. Okay. Okay, any questions on this? Otherwise, we would see this move to be an action item on the next agenda for July. And, and the rest of these we'll have additional information on as the group has their open house, et cetera. Okay. If I can make one more comment of something I forgot to mention, but if we were to move to the concept of um, additional paid parking or leased spaces, that right now we hold the funds that are generated from our current leased lots in a in a spe special bucket um, and the goal would be to use those funds specifically well, to reconstruct future lots or to put towards uh, maintenance of uh, some of the landscaping needs um, in the downtown area so it would return to the same general district which i think would be a great I idea can I make a couple comments about well, first of all, two things. Number one, I do agree on that crosswalk because we do have a similar crosswalk over at the high school that crosses over Water Street, comes from K Street, literally into a grassy area, works, got a sign. Everybody stops immediately when the students cross the street. So we do have another crosswalk similar to what you're recommending here to avoid having a collision with students. So that um, has worked. The other thing regarding paying for the lots, primarily for those, the spots for the 24 hour parking that's on that unit, that parking lot that's next to the post office. When I had my business on Main Street, which obviously was a long time ago, it really upset me that those cars were there for weeks and I had to deal with the other two spots plus with the plowing, those cars couldn't go anywhere. So they were taking two lots, three, you know, three spots, two spots. So I am really gonna look forward to having some type of resolution for those spots that are currently 24 hours um, next to the post office. Okay, let's move on to C, contract 1317, Third Street parking lot reconstruction. Yes, um, on June 20th, uh, we opened one bid for the parking lot reconstruction and uh, um, the bids were nearly double our original estimate. Uh, we believe that um, much of that is because the bidding was done later in the year and that uh, bidders were not really interested in doing that project at this time. Uh, so uh, what staff is recommending is that we uh, look at carrying funds over to 2018 and rebid it for uh, in 2018 in the late winter uh, with our normal 2018 projects and we feel that prices will be more competitive. And so uh, the council will need to formally reject the bid 
Okay, does anybody have That's any? what you want to do. Yeah, does anybody have any questions on that? Otherwise, we'll also move that to action for the next meeting. Go for it. Okay, let's move on to the 2018 proposed budget timeline. Um, really, we, we just uh, placed this in the budget to uh, start to outline some dates uh, for the 2018 budget cycle. Um, so we want you to see these and let us know if there are any um, potential dates that are not definitely not going to work. Otherwise, we would like you to mark these dates on your calendar um, so that you have them blocked off for the process. Okay, so that would be August 8th, which is a regular count. That is a regular, uh, I have to look. Say, well, work Folks, look at the. Uh, it, mm, yes, it's a regular council meeting. Right, it's a regular council meeting. Uh, and then uh, August 22nd, which is not a regular meeting. That is also a regular meeting. Yes, okay. And then uh, the review session on October 3rd another review session on October 17th, and the third review session, if necessary, on October 31st. And then uh, uh, we would take final action uh, on uh, and have the public hearing on November 28th. Ready? That's the plan. Okay. Any questions? Otherwise, put those on your calendar. All right, let's move on to the final item on our agenda, which is the baseball softball hitting stations. Yes. Um, so at our last uh, Parks, Forest, and Recreation Committee, we had members of the Platteville Youth Diamond Sports, or I should say one member of Platteville Youth Diamond Sports. Um, they're presenting a proposal to install hitting stations directly to the east of the existing batting cages. Um, a hitting station, I've attached a couple pictures in your packet, but essentially it is just a, um, a space where a child or an adult could hit a ball off a tee into a net. Um, and they're used quite often um, for coaching and during practices. Um, and they like that area because that is where they have pitching mounds, the existing batting cages, plus with the addition of this, they'd be able to run um, close to a full practice from that one location. Um, they are asking um, for the city to approve the expenditure from the Legion Park Advertising Trust. Um, that is the trust or the money that comes from the sign uh, rental fees that is up there. Um, so currently we're bringing in close to $10,000 or over $10,000 annually from those sign funds um, in ongoing um, revenue. That money is divided 50% into a trust, 50% into an endowment. Um, this would come from that trust portion of that money. So it's money that can only be spent on um, baseball and softball programming improvements, um, things like that in Legion Park. Um, so they're asking to uh, spend up to $6,000 from that account. Um, I did include that current account balance is just over $18,000 in there. Um, and uh, because this would be a budget change, this is not something we budgeted, it would, I believe it would require a two-thirds vote, um, but that is not money that would need to come from a different account or by cutting something else. We do have the money in the account. It would just need to be allocated. Any questions about hitting stations? Is this going to go into the parking lot? No, the opposite direction. So it's going to be match. Okay, right now they have those hitting the parking lot would be to the west of the existing batting cages. This would be to okay. the east. Direction problem today. Okay. Oh. Could I go up and use them when uh, nothing else is going on? Absolutely can. I'll join you. Good. Any other questions? Any other volunteers? Okay, then we'll expect to move that for action at the next meeting, too. And. It appears we're at the number 10 item on our agenda. Also move that we adjourn. Second a motion. We have a motion in the second, Tom and Ken, that we adjourn. We'll vote. Westby? Yes. Doss? Yes. Francis? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Killian? Yes. No? Yes. Motion carries. Long awaited. Yes. Well, you haven't had a long one for a while.